Moving to uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4, and uh, it's a good chapter. It's very short, uh, but there is there's some good little nuggets to, to pull out of it. Uh, I'm pulling from Tony Moreta. If you remember him, he was at Temple here in Hattiesburg. Uh, David Gusick, uh, Gino Garassi, John Piper, and a few others uh, on, on this particular uh, Timothy four episode. Um, if, uh, Ned, you are number one in the shoot, if you would read one through five, pretty big chunk. Sure. So if you can handle it, I know you're a lawyer, but you know, I think you can handle it. <laughs> uh, now the spirit spirit expressly says that in later, latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Cool. All right. Thank you, Ned. Hey, Jamal. Hey, everyone. Sorry for the lateness. So some will depart from the faith to follow teachings of demons. When? When did he say that would happen? In the latter times. Latter later. times. So it can pretty much, and this is, this is pretty early times when he was mentioning this. This is 40 AD, something like that. Pretty, pretty early times. So pretty much it's been latter times. The church age you can kind of consider as being the latter times. Ever since Jesus resurrected to now is latter times because we don't know when the Lord's coming back. So it's latter times, you know. And this has been pretty consistent since 40 AD. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Pretty consistent. So uh, how many will, will depart? Some. 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 So uh, again. We don't know how many. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, but but let's not be surprised when this when it does happen. Um, how's well, it going to happen? It's going to happen through the influence of de deceitful spirits. So there's purposeful acts of the enemy in order to derail the truth. Um, and it says uh, teachings of demons. Uh, so, uh, are they sincere? No. They are liars who used to have a good conscience, but their consciences have been seared, or rather, as a burned nerve endings, their conscience is useless. So, they, they're just doing it for money. What, for what they think is going to be making them feel good or power or whatever. Uh, what are they teaching? Uh, and I'll go ahead and answer this because uh, it's a different word. They're teaching asceticism. Asceticism. That's A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M. Asceticism. It's a lifestyle characterized by abstinence from sensual pleasures, often for the purpose of pursuing spiritual goals. And so what are they doing? They're forbidding marriage and certain foods. They're denying the blessings of like steak, potatoes, chocolate. And anybody that denies chocolate, you know, they've got to be a false prophet, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so how and these things are good. These things are, are, are what the Lord has has ordained marriage. And, and foods, all things. So uh, if we receive them with thanksgiving and prayer, then even as we pray over our food, in a sense, it's blessed you know, before it goes into our body. Don't be, you know, um, pharisaical about it, but be thankful 
who was it? Uh, David Gusick, I think, brought out a really good statement about cults in particular. He said, uh, what do false teachers and religions or cults teach? First of all, they say they forbid what the Bible allows, and they allow what the Bible forbids very often. <laughs> so two triggers, you know, that they start laying down laws and and uh, doing things that the Bible says not to do. Yeah, there's a pretty good indication they're a cult. Oh. All right, verse 6, Doug, just just verse 6. Just verse 6. Just verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. All right. It's just encouraging him. So it's, it's an exhortation to have a real spiritual discipline versus asceticism, which is kind of close to legalism, as we've kind of seen. So spiritual discipline is God-centered, motivated by love and gratitude, powered by the Spirit, overflowing with awe of God, where asceticism is man-centered, works-based righteousness. Man-centered, works-based righteousness. Uh, verses 7 and 8, Jamal, please, sir. I have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, rather than train yourself for god godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, god godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the presence of life and also for the life to come. All right. I love how the script, this translation has, uh, I, ju I just saw, is this is Eng Eng English Standard Version. Mm -hmm. I love how it has silly written in there. It's like silly. silly I'm like, huh, yeah. that's a word you think you wouldn't see in the Bible. Silliness. I, like I think uh, one translation says uh, wives' tales. Wives' tales. Yeah. It's like it says silly. But like you know, we, we, we all can name one myth. That people accept as a truth. I'm like I can name about five right now. Ooh, sure. But a silly myth. Yep. I'm so trying. he's 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 about to uh, equate working out physically with uh, with staying true to to God's word, and so and I, I like how he he starts to do it when he rather train yourself. And so you don't passively become godly. I love the sermon that, that uh, Pastor Chad did a number of years back, and he was explaining when he was, um, they were swimming in the ocean. He was a younger man. He was swimming in the ocean uh, just off the beach, and he was, you know, with a snorkel or something like that. He had his head down. He wasn't paying any attention. And he wasn't looking at, at the shore, wasn't looking where his uh, family was or anything. And he looks up, and all of a sudden, he's way down the coastline. The co the 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 uh, tide or whatever has the flow has taken him down, and he didn't even notice, you know. So if we don't continually train and continually work at staying with the standard, staying with Scripture, we're going to passively be moved off, moved off course. Yeah, I thought that was a great analogy uh, that we've got to stay in the Word and stay praying uh, in order to, to know what uh, and to stay with the standard. So how is it that we do train? How, how do we train? How do we train our spirits? Well, we stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. Prayer. Stay in prayer. That's it. Two biggies. Uh Two things that are kind of hard to do, hard to stay consistent at, at, but hugely important, hugely important. Can we change God's mind? No. Okay. Let me challenge you a little bit here. I know okay. I, God knows the future and stuff, but remember when Moses uh, was with the children of Israel in the desert? And uh, 
God was upset with them, and God said, move aside, Moses, I'm going to kill them. What did Moses do? Did he plead for them? He sure did. And he, what he, specifically, he reminded God with his own words. And he also, in other words, you know, that he'll, uh, uh, what he, how he would bless the nation of Israel and that type of thing. And he also said, uh, you wouldn't want your name to be um, drugged through the mud, basically, with the people who saw this happen, you know. So it, God made it at least look like Moses changed his mind. He, yeah, you're right. He probably didn't. God, I mean, God knew what was going to happen. But he was training Moses and us to pray back to him his own words and to have a pure heart about it. But John Piper brought out uh, praying scripture, and it doesn't seem to be real specific scripture, but he, he said, this is what he says, uh, if I try to pray for people or events without having the word in front of me, uh, guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. And he goes into a litany of, of, you know, he notices the Venetian blinds are halfway open. There's a siren down the street. All these distractions that are happening to him. Um, and so what he does, he said, you can pray all day if you pray the Bible. Some people wonder how you can pray longer than five minutes because they have, um, uh, they lose things to pray for. But I say, if you open the Bible, start reading it and pause at every verse and turn it into a prayer, then you can pray all day that way. And so I've, I've been trying to do that in order to just enrich, and I've enjoyed it. It's been good. So read a verse, ponder on it a minute, and how does that relate to what so-and-so is doing and needing and that type of thing? Where are we spiritually? And so that has uh, it's been enriching. I've, uh, I'm just trying it. So, so that's, that's kind of like using the method that they tell us to do in our daily reading. Okay. Where, where you pray by what they call acts, mm -hmm. acknowledge, confess, thanksgiving, yeah. and supplication. Mm -hmm. So as you read a verse, that's what you're doing. You're mm -hmm. working through that verse. Yeah. Cool. So very, very useful. Uh, let's pull in uh, verse 9 and 10. Uh, Ned, would you read... The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toll and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. All right. So for whom do we strive is the question. God, well... Is that that would be in reference to the previous verse, godliness? Godliness, yeah. For God, uh, for who is our Savior. Yep. Uh, it becomes a little difficult if you read it real closely. Um, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is Savior of all people. Okay, Savior of all people. And then he says, especially of those who believe. Well, wait a minute here. So who's he saving? So I had to look this one up. Um, this is a fellow by the name of, uh, this is no, Bengal Noman. That's G-N-O-M-E-N. -E um, he says, Paul shows that he, and this was written a long time ago, so hang with me on the English. Paul shows that he and men like him hope for a double salvation from God, salvation for uh, or safety in this life, for God saves or else preserves all men. Nay, I like that, I like that term, nay, even he wishes all men to have salvation forever. As also, what is of greater consequence in the life that is to come, for he especially saves or preserves them that believe. So them being us. So he's looking at it from the perspective of God saves everybody right now by his absolute mercy of not pulling out 
remember you guys were with uh, with us in uh, Revelation. Remember what happened when God pulled out of the earth, uh, out of the world? What happened to the world? Utter chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Total, total chaos. Total and complete chaos. So just his presence in the world is saving us for the moment, saving everybody from the chaos that is to ensue later on. And that's the impression that we get from that particular scripture. Does anybody else have any, anything different, maybe in a commentary that uh, he might have brought out? Um, I, I, the one that I was, I, it keeps coming to me that I'm, I'm understanding where it says uh, it means that Christ died for all people, mm-hmm. but only those who believe in him are saved. Right. Right. So it, it, he died for everybody, but everybody will not have salvation yeah. if they don't believe in him. Yeah. The offer is there. Offer that's right. salvation is there. He's savior of everybody, but especially exactly. those who believe. And so the terminology there might have been said differently, but yeah, I can see that too. That that makes sense, but it doesn't quite read that way, you yeah. know. It, yeah. yeah, I didn't flesh out. Honestly, I didn't flesh out too many other, you know, any other um, um, translations. And it may have been it just better in another translation. Okay, the time came for the Bible study to come to an end in the evening. I uh, wanted to respect everybody's time. But I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be out of pocket for about the next month. Uh, Ned's going to be gone possibly the uh, next month. So I really wanted to finish um, Chapter 4. And that would kind of make it a little bit cleaner. So I'll continue in in this, and and uh, we can pick it up with the guys later on. But I want this to be a little bit cleaner on on YouTube as well. So it starts out in um, eleven and twelve: command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct in love, in faith, in purity. You know, it's interesting he said command and not suggest. Uh, And so command implies uh, a fully expected compliance with an expectation of uh, a negative consequence for non-compliance. So in this case, probably being put out of the church, as we saw in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. So 12, was Timothy instructed to rebuke anyone for implying he was young? No, Uh, he was to have a reputation of maturity. So how do you get a reputation of maturity? Well, first of all, by being an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity, very clearly. So how can, how can you not respect someone of any age with those qualities? Uh, those qualities kind of demand an implied respect, no matter what the age they have. Verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. So what should Timothy specifically be doing at this point? Number one, publicly read the scripture. And we have to ask ourselves, what was considered scripture at that time? Remember, it was early on in the church age. Well, certainly the whole Old Testament, but likely all the New Testament, all the New Testament letters in circulation at that time. Uh, there's implication that they were starting to consider them to be to be scripture. Certainly, uh, Timothy was familiar with Paul's writings, 
And since Paul was his mentor, he certainly respected Paul's writing and would have probably considered them scripture as well. It was a number of years later, but Peter brings out that uh, Paul's writings were actually scripture. So it's likely at this time, even earlier on, uh, Timothy recognized that Paul's writings were scripture. So he had that concept and he was with Paul quite a bit. 14. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. On you. This is more clue from when Paul has mentioned this before, when the elders laid hands on, on Timothy. Uh, there was a council of elders who, by prophecy, notice they didn't give the gift of prophecy necessarily, but by prophecy, gave him a gift or gifts, but it doesn't say what those gifts are. You know, we can probably guess it's teaching or prophecy somewhere in that realm, maybe leadership, maybe all of them, uh, but it doesn't say. 15, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. So how do we practice our gifts? We exercise our gifts by immersing ourselves in the gift, by obsessing or engro being engrossed in it. An Olympic runner immerses themselves in running in methodology, in high-speed video to see where they're making their mistakes, uh, where they're burning too much energy, obsessing over every little move. And so in the same way, we can exercise our spiritual growth by immersing ourselves in, in the Word. And we practice our gifts. How can we practice our gifts? So why would we practice our gifts? Well, for the same reason as verse 12, for your reputation in Christ. 16, <clears throat> final verse. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So how do you watch yourself? Well, be honest with yourself. Warning, though, uh, we have big blind spots. We have big personal blind spots. And so it's best if we have somebody else to help us in that. But Timothy was likely the most mature, spiritually mature Christian where he was. And uh, he may not have had help. So we think about our missionaries who are on the field in areas where there are not a lot or any other Christian. They have to watch themselves. They have to watch the, for their own blind spots. And so we have to be on this side of sending missionaries. As our pastor says, we have to hold the rope on this side and uh, pray for them, encourage them, communicate with them that we're praying for them, communicate with them, uh, and help them financially, obviously, uh, those that are, that are alone. Second question we'll ask ourselves about 16, why be honest with ourselves? Well, it answers that. For our salvation and for those who hear and observe us, so there is uh, 1 Timothy 4. We will see you in some time later for 1 Timothy 5.